Rajeshwari Dutt. I am a faculty in the Institute of Technology, Mandi, in India. So um, I guess one of the interesting things about my work is that I'm based in India, studying Latin America. is the caste war important? Um, so one of the important things about the caste war is how long it was. Uh, it was it's one of the longest sort of um, uh, ethnic wars or, or in any case, any kind of um, conflict that we see in Latin American history, uh, which goes on from 1847 to 1901. In terms of you know, the scale of the war, uh, the population of Yucatan plummets by 40% uh, in just the first two decades of the war. So it's just really remarkable in terms of the magnitude of it, right? But I think the broader reason why the caste war is important is because it tells us a story of Maya survival, right? Um, that the Maya remained one of the uh, unconquered um, ancient cultures. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about the Maya as a culture is that whereas it took uh, just a few years for the Spanish to conquer the Aztecs, it took much longer time to conquer the Maya. And even then there were pockets of resistance where they were not ever fully conquered. Um, and, and I think this sort of ability of the Maya to continuously resist onslaught um, is something that we also see in the caste war. Um, and I think that's sort of the broader reason why I think the caste war is important because I think it tells us a story of Maya survival. So one of the interesting things about post-independence Mexico is how unstable uh, Mexico is uh, in terms, and especially uh, Yucatan, in terms of the conflicts you see within political parties in Yucatan. So you have centralists, right, who are interested in being part of Mexico. And then you have federalists who want more autonomy for Yucatan. When these political parties square off against each other, they are also trying to recruit soldiers, right? They are also trying to see who can serve for them. And the, the vast majority of Yucatan is, is Maya. So the naturally the, the people they want to recruit are the Maya people. And when they want to recruit Maya people, they do it by um, talking about tax exemptions that they can get and by arming them. And of course, when these uh, promises are not kept, um, you see a spiraling of uh, things out of control. Uh, there are you know, moments when the rebels actually start moving in into Valladolid um, and uh, uh, taking those you know, really important Hispanic centers of control. Um, and, and you start having the Yucatecan government also then moving in to try to control this. Um, and in fact, by 1848, you start seeing, you know, initially the Maya are, are successful, but by 1848, you also start seeing the Yucatecan government becoming able to push them back. Um, and, and so they are they, they, they do reverse the losses of the first year or so. And then the Maya become pushed back. But as they push further into the East, two things happen. One is that the Maya themselves, who now the rebels become known as the Santa Cruz Maya because they have their own capital in Chan Santa Cruz, become more radical in the sense of having now a kind of religious fervor to what they are doing. At the same time, as they are moving eastward, they become less and less of less seen as an emergency, right? Because people in the northwest of Yucatan um, now don't want to shoulder the burden of finances and other things to, you know, to stamp out the caste war, especially if it means moving, going further and further east, where, uh, you know, where they, they really don't have much interest. And so I think the prolongation of the war also happens because as the rebels move into the interior, there, there is less government interest in, uh, you know, sort of spending that much money in controlling something that now seems to be going away. After this point, after the 1850s, right, you don't see large scale combat anymore, right? You don't see people squaring off. You see raids, you see surprise attacks. And some historians have called this sort of a steady state violence, which happens throughout the rest of the 19th century. There's violence. Uh, you know, pervading society is just not full-scale war anymore after that, that point. Um, and it's only towards the end of the 19th century, especially with Britain uh, sort of signing the Spencer-Mariscal Treaty with, um, uh, uh, with Mexico, which 
you know, where they stop providing arms and ammunition to the rebels. And then of course, Porfirio Diaz coming in and then sending his army um, and sort of stamping out the rebels that you finally have an end to the war. To begin with, there were several factors that caused this conflict to start. One I've already touched on, which is the political parties involved um, and how the political parties sort of tried to get Maya people and recruit them as soldiers to fight their internal wars. Um, the second is that there's also a growing sort of, you know, land grab that happens in the southeast of Mexico, uh, in Yucatan. Um, and this is with sort of the rising commercialization of agriculture, the rising rise of um, more haciendas. Um, and so you start seeing, you know, so, so Maya people always had land which was left fallow, right? Uncultivated because of the kind of slash and burn cultivation they, they followed. But those lands which were sort of termed as baldio lands, right? Which were the uncultivated lands, the terrenos baldios, were seen as sort of, you know, lands which were not used. Um, and those were grabbed. And when those were grabbed, that was a real problem for, for, for the Maya as well. So this is a land issue as well. Um, another thing we know is that it was a tax issue. Um, there were lots of taxes that Maya people had to shoulder, including church taxes called obvenciones. Um, and those became really critical because we know that, you know, the, uh, the areas of um, of Yucatan, where the first parts of the conflict happened, like Tepic and other places, were sort of also places which had a longer history of tax resistance. And another part, right, which I think um, we kind of need to talk more about is um, the role of the Maya themselves, right, in terms of their um, communities. So from, you know, from sort of pre-colonial times, right, pre-conquest times, the Maya had their uh, community, which is known as the Ka, um, and it had a leader who was known as the Batab. And the Batab had a very significant um, position, right? He was in charge of administering justice. He was the, you know, the chief. He was, uh, you know, sort of uh, the person who kind of uh, looked over the whole community. Now, when, um, when uh, you have the conquest happening and Spanish people come in, at first, uh, you know, the past continue, right? A lot of it has to do with the fact that Yucatan is really, um, um, you know, sort of comparatively a backwater area where it was not very easy to control for the Spanish. So they needed middlemen, right? Um, and so the Batabs were seen as a middleman who could operate on behalf of the Spanish. So the Batab had this, really crucial kind of balancing role to play at the same time as they had to cater to the Spanish interest. They also had to keep their communities happy. And, and that, and those Batabs, right, became known uh, by the Spanish as caciques. And of course, uh, the Spanish applied the term cacique to refer to indigenous headmen across the Americas. Um, but in, in Yucatan, we should remember that there was already a Batab, right? There was, the cacique was just the Batab who was then seen as this Gobernador Cacique. He was, it's just the transformation of the same person, right? Into uh, this. And what we know is that it's the alienation of the caciques that plays a big role in sparking of the conflict. One of the things that happens is that up until 1821, the caciques do have a, a pretty important role to play. But as soon as you have independence of Mexico and liberal rule, you start seeing a progressive sort of curtailment of cacique privileges, cacique rights and uh, abilities to govern. Uh, and they become pretty much glorified tax collectors. They don't have many other, um, you know, sort of abilities left or other roles left. Um, and what we know is that uh, a lot of the, the main Maya people who led the caste war rebels were people like Cecilio Chi, like Jacinto Pat, who were caciques. Um, and, and I think that's part of the story, right? It's not just about like race. It's not about uh, an ethnic or a race war. It's about a sort of a progressive disempowerment um, that the communities faced, especially with liberal policies that, you know, uh, slowly, right, um, curtailed the autonomy of com in Maya communities.
In terms of who is involved in the caste war, and I think this is again why talking about the caste war as a race war doesn't make, uh, you know, is, is, makes less sense actually. Um, one of the interesting things is that there were a lot of mestizos also a part of the rebel groups. The other thing is that it's also a multicultural in the sense that we see black people among the Maya rebels, uh, black lumbermen from Belize come into it and become part of the, uh, uh, you know, the rebel Maya or the Santa Cruz, the Cruz of society. We have Chinese contract workers who come and join rebel ranks. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, uh, in terms of governments involved in all of this, of course you have on the one hand, you know, the Maya rebels fighting against the Mexican government, also getting a lot of, you know, um, you, know uh, you know, sort of help in terms of British um, uh, government in Belize, right? So there is a, a division among the Maya themselves, but some of the Maya who become known as the Santa Cruz Maya because they established their capital in Chan Santa Cruz, which is currently Felipe Cario Puerto. Um, and uh, they establish um, a religion there. They have a Oracle of the Speaking Cross, which becomes part of the, the way that the Maya becomes sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, the idea of sort of a, a religious fervor of war kind of starts there. Um, and so that you have happening with Maya who are retreating towards Chan Santa Cruz. And then you have these other Pacifico groups like the Chichen Ha Maya and the San Pedro Maya. These people are um, having a, an understanding with the Mexican government, but they're also moving southward into Belize. Um, and, and so there's uh, these different Maya groups involved as well. So I think in terms of looking at who's involved in the caste war, it's really important to see like how, how diverse and in fact complicated it was. Uh, it was not just the Maya versus white. Uh, that's, that was just not how it went. It was much more complicated than that. Uh, as an Indian, I have been studying how India connects to the caste war. And although at first it may seem quite unlikely, in fact, it's quite interesting how the Maya followed events in India. Um, the 19th century sees the development of telegraph lines, which actually connects people across the world through news networks. Um, news is able to travel very quickly. And what I find in my own work is how the, uh, the Chan Santa Cruz Maya actually look to developments in India. In India, we had around the same period in the 1850s, um, a very important uprising known as the Sepoy Mutiny, which was a huge challenge to British colonial rule. And the Maya in Mexico are looking to those developments um, and it's influencing the way they are reacting to the British in Belize. Um, and I think that's just one of the, uh, you know, many kinds of transnational dimensions we can explore. Um, Belize is a, is a very, uh, I think, uh, important example of this as well. One of the things we think about when you think about the caste war is that it is Mexican, but actually it's, it's not just Mexican. Uh, the caste war changes how Belize as a nation becomes. Uh, the, when uh, the caste war begins, you have scores of Maya and Mestizo people crossing the Rio Hondo, which is the river that separates Mexico and Belize, and uh, coming in huge numbers into the northern towns of Belize. In fact, Belize's population increases tenfold as a result of the caste war. The other really important thing that happens in Belize is that before the Maya and Mestizo people moved into Belize, Belize was mainly a timber economy. So the, uh, the main uh, you know, economy of Belize was extraction of logwood and mahogany. When Maya people and Mestizo people start coming into Belize, they bring with them the knowledge of agriculture. So they begin to start their own milpas um, and, uh, and other ways of, uh, of growing food. Um, and so you start having, for instance, sugar being cultivated and sugar becomes an important export commodity in Belize. Um, and all of this, right, leads to Belize also becoming a more than a settlement. So Belize up until the 1860s is just a British settlement. But once the agricultural potential of Belize is unlocked, it petitions for town colony status, which gives it more imperial aid from Britain and therefore changes Belize's path as well. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's something that we don't really um, you know, explore because we think of the caste war as such a Mexican thing, but really it transforms, uh, transforms Belize in many ways, including the fact that the Northern border towns like Corozal, Orange Walk become largely 
um, uh, uh, you know, Mestizo Maya regions. Um, and I think these are uh, just some ways. I think there's a lot more to explore in terms of transnational dimensions of the caste war, which hasn't been explored. I think there's just a lot to be said about the caste war being something that was relevant at a global level, not just as a Mexican uh, uh, event. One of the important things, um, having lived in the U.S. myself, is that we often have, um, you know, the sense of the Maya as an ancient culture, uh, and I think a lot of this is, you know, buttressed by the fact that when spring break happens, people go to Cancun, and then they see that okay, this, and then and you know the the tourist shops, um, and even in the airport shops, are always selling artifacts, like small, you know, fridge magnets about Kijanitza. I mean, the whole sort of culture around the Maya, at least for the U.S. consumption, right, is ancient Maya. Um, and, and I think that the, the, there, there's a problem there, which is that uh, this valorization of the ancient Maya happens at the same time as the modern Maya are neglected. Um, that modern Maya history is not really well known or or uh, understood. We think of uh, Mexico as a very homogeneous place. Um, and I think there's a lot of stereotyping that happens in terms of how we look at Mexicans. Or, and a lot of this is, has to do with uh, the culture where we have Mexican food, taste the same one way. But, you know, having been and uh, lived in Merida, I know how Yucatecan food is really different from the fare that you serve in a Mexican restaurant, right? So every place has its own different food, its own different culture. And the moment we homogenize Mexico, uh, we do it a disservice. So I think that it's really important to acknowledge that the diversity of Mexico and the diversity of people there, because it's only by acknowledging that that we can actually understand the cultural richness of Mexico. And then we understand that we respect uh, all Mexicans. Uh, and I think that those are the seeds out of which you start having real harmonious relations a real res mutual respect, which is, I think, the basis of all good relationships among uh, people in different countries. Mm -hmm.